been talking about the paths to creative spirituality. The third path is exclaiming the divine creature. This third path creates space to explore how God is working in and through us and all of the universe to renew each day in every direction. Each moment offers opportunity to express our God-gifted creativity. We hear messages, ancient and new, that express and affirm the divine at work and encourage us in our creative collaboration with the divine. We do this today by hearing the scripture from John 21, 15 through 19, and considering what Jesus meant in his conversation with Peter. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of God, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus was asking a third time, do you love me? But he replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So this season, we are looking at what creation spirituality is and what it might say to us. Because it has a very different message than what we are used to hearing in the church. Creation spirituality comes from a place, it begins at a place that says, God has created all of the earth and all of humanity and each of us in it as good. Just as the, the first story of Genesis says, that as God created and God saw that it was good. As opposed to what is often um, our theology and, and is often taught in the church, especially in, in our history, is more of what we call fall and redemption theology, which says that Yes, initially we were good, but then we made mistakes and, and we, we were deemed sinful and then in need of God to redeem us. That comes from Augustine and that, that the bigger picture of that, though, sets up a situation for us to look at scarcity to look at creation and life from a, a, a standpoint of scarcity, that there's not enough, that somehow there might not be enough of God's love 
for everyone. So we have to be redeemed. That we have to repent in order to be worthy of love. Like God would not love everyone just as they are. Creation spirituality changes that around and says everyone is created in the image and likeness of God and therefore is good. In fact, not only are we good, but we were created to be a blessing to the world. We are blessed with, through our birth to be a blessing to the world. That's also the position of our Jewish brothers and sisters. They read the same stories that we do in what we call the Old Testament, what they call the Hebrew Bible, but they don't come out at the same place. They don't see this fall and redemption piece. They see us as blessed to be a blessing. And so I'm encouraging us this season to look at this way, of this type of theology and, and what does that say to us? This, today's theme is about love. And, and I think the word love is one of the most uh, misunderstood words in our, in our language. And part of that comes from when, when we translated um, some of our words, changed from the Greek to English, um, we use love to cover a lot of different types of love, right? So um, we can have, you know, we can say things, and well, I, I wanted to tell you that there was, a couple of years ago, there was a, um, a person came up to me after I had preached the, you know, Jesus says we need to love one another, we need to love our neighbor uh, as ourself, and he, a person came up to me and said, but I cannot love just anyone the same way I love my wife. Well, I get that. That's two totally different kinds of love, right? That's where we need to break this down. Um, and I found that C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Four Loves, helps us to work through some of this. So the first type of love, or the first level of love, is storge. Storge is a love of things. That's when I say, I love chocolate cake, okay? That's, that's a storge kind of love. That is a, you know, it's, um, the, the kids often have this thing um, that if they hear somebody say, well, I love that, and they say, well, if you love it so much, why don't you marry it? You know, like, I wouldn't marry chocolate cake, okay? Um, my love for chocolate cake and my love for David are very different. Those are different types of love, right? But, there, but you know, storge is, is sort of this, you know, I really appreciate that, or that's something I deeply like, okay? Then there's philia. Philia is more of an affinity towards something. It is like a deep friendship. You have a deep appreciation for another. Um, that's, that's philia, okay? And then there's eros. Eros is, is a romantic, a physical love, okay? The, the kind that stirs, stirs the, the sensations in our bodies, right? And then there is agape. And agape is a divine love. It's an unconditional love. It is a love that is unearned, unachievable. You cannot, you cannot get, you cannot work hard enough to get agape love. Agape love is something that is just given. It is a gift, a grace, a mercy. Agape love is the kind of love that God gives to us. This might not be a good example, but it was the, it was the example that went in my mind, is that I would say that I have a philia type of love um, or a storge type of love towards my dog. 
right? I like my dog a lot. She's important to me. She's, she's, she is part of my life. But my dog's love for me is a whole lot closer to agape than anything that I know. Because no matter what I do, that dog is thoroughly excited to see me every time I walk in the door. And no matter what I've done, it doesn't matter if I was gone 20 minutes or eight hours, she has the same amount of excitement for me. Now, maybe that's not a good, I'm not trying to compare God and the dog. That's not, that's not my intent there. But, but it's that totally unconditional, unearned. It's not because of anything that I've done, but that I am just loved. That's the kind of love that God has for us. And I'm saying this because I want to go back to our scripture. Because it's interesting to see what the words are in Greek. So when we have this exchange between Jesus and Peter, Jesus is saying, do you agape love me? The word that they use is agape. Do you agape love me? And Peter's response is, yes, Lord, you know that I feel you love you. I hope because of that last slide, you hear a little bit of a difference. So, so Jesus is saying, do you love me with an unearned love? Not because of who I am, not because of what I've done, but can you love me with, with a larger love, with a greater love that has nothing to do with who I am? And P Peter's saying, oh, but I do love you because you, you deserve the, my love. You, I, you are such a good friend to me. You are, you are the Christ. You were raised from the dead. You're God. You deserve my loves. Do you see the difference? With Jesus trying to, to pull Peter to a greater level, this story... Um, and we just sang the Lakeshore because it, um, the, the bigger story that I didn't take time to read was that, that it, it starts with them, Peter's out fishing um, in the boats and they're not catching things. And then Jesus gives him direction and says, throw the, uh, the net on the other side and they get a big haul and they come in. And Jesus is cooking fish and eating fish with them. And, and they're, uh, so they're at the, lakes, at the lake shore. But, but Jesus, and, and this whole story is often called the redemption of Peter because it's, it's one of the first um, accounts of a conversation that we have between Jesus and Peter after the resurrection. After Peter denied Jesus before the crucifixion and left him, um, here is Jesus and Peter coming together and, and, and they're talking about this love. But, but I think there's, there's this other piece. So yes, Peter's redeemed, but there's this other piece where Peter is pushed a little bit further. It's sort of the um, idea, I, I heard a conversation between an employee and a manager, and the employee was saying to the manager, why are you so hard on me? Why, why, do, you, why do you, can you not cut me some slack? I'm trying to do this job. And the manager said, I don't cut you slack because you can do so much more. You have so much more potential. That's what I hear between Jesus and Peter. Peter, you have so much more potential. Yes, you love me as, as a friend and, and as a good, you know, you recognize me as God, but I want you to be able to go out and love everyone the way you love me. I want you to love them with a higher love, with a greater love. And then we have this, you know, Jesus refers to the people as sheep. Well, it, we talk about sheep. That there's an, often a correlation between people and sheep. And, and we are the sheep, okay? And sheep are dumb. 
Sheep do not get it. They, you know, if, if sheep are not moved, they will eat the grass to the, to the dirt and they will start eating the dirt. They don't know any better to move along. So they need someone who's guiding them. And Jesus is asking Peter to take these poor people who really don't know what they're doing and guide them, too, to a better place. Guide them into a deeper and richer faith. Tend my lambs. Tend my little ones. Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Give them more than the philia love. Give them agape love. Give them this unconditional love. So all that being said, I'm trying to, last time I was, at 9.15 I kept going back in slides and I, that made my sermon too long. That's one of the things you don't ever go back. <laughs> don't ever go back. Always go forward. But, but I, I sat with that and said, what would, it, what would it look like if we could love the world and everyone in it with agape love? Think about that. Um, and then I tried to think about, about some of the things that are going on in our world. And yesterday at the seminary, the, the, um, Dr. McNeary Nelson, she used to be the president at Millersville. She was the speaker. And she made the comment that right now, hatred and bigotry are mainstream. That's not agape love. That's not what God is about. That's not what God wants us to be about. I also thought of these two situations that are or issues that are on my heart and, on, and in my head. On the left is uh, actually a poster for a rally that will be in June about Pennsylvania's funding of public education. Right now, our funding of public education is very much um, tilted towards school districts that are white. I can give you the documentation. We have plenty of, plenty of information on this subject. Um, Holly Climo is going to do a workshop after each service on May 19th about this subject. That um, the whiter the district, the more money they get from the state. And we are trying to change the formula so that there is some equity because all children in our state deserve a chance to have the resources and the staffing to become the, the child that God has created them to be, to, to pursue their full potential. And so we're trying to change some laws about that. And the picture on the right is from the Methodist Conference, which is right now very much in this in this grieving process where their conference, their, the larger denominations said that they are not going to be welcoming to LGBTQ folk. And there's plenty of people within the denomination who want that to change and who, who are LGBT or have family and friends that are that and they want them to be fully accepted. I lift this up specifically to you also because we have the potential to be that also. This June at our synod, we have re every year there's resolutions that come up for conversation. And there is a resolution for our synod that says, <clears throat> well, so let me, let me go back before I go to the resolution. So in the UCC, we say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we have been very inclusive of LGBTQ folk in our churches. But there is a group within our denomination. They, are, they call themselves faithful and welcoming. And they 
do not agree with the denomination's position. And because with, we are the UCC, we allow for those differences. So there are faithful and welcoming churches who, do, who see LGBTQ as a sin and, and an abomination and, and are not welcome. And then there are churches that are called open and affirming that do welcome, and actually we are neither of those. We have, not, we have not lined ourselves out with either of those, but I do preach about everyone being welcome here. So the open and affirm, some open and affirming churches have a resolution this June to silence the welcoming and faithful congregations and say that they cannot speak in our general synods. They cannot have a booth. At the last general synod, my understanding of the situation was that they had a booth at the synod and that there were words said back and forth where members of our denomination called other members, of, like members of the faithful and welcoming, called people who were advocates or LGBT people, um, told them that they were not welcome in the church. And there was, there was this friction. Um, and that's what we can't be. And, and I really hope that this, doesn't, this resolution doesn't pass or we're going to be at the same place that the Methodists are. Because although we are saying, you know, we're, we're, we're in a different place because we're saying we're open to LGBTQ, but how can we say... We are here no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey if we can't allow those with a different opinion to be here. This gets difficult, folks. This is not easy stuff. So this is where we have to say, I can disagree with you and not be disagreeable. And you need to do that too. I can have a different position than you but I need to still see you as a child of God, and you need to see me as a child of God. Agape love. It has to be more than our positions. And we can't, at the same time, I'm not willing, because I am in favor of LGBTQ folks, I'm not willing to let people who are not in favor of LGBT have any way of making rules or laws to exclude. They can't exclude others. They can't exclude LGBT, and we can't exclude them. Folks, this is grown-up stuff. This is not kids' stuff. This is not tribalism. This is the opposite of tribalism. And that's where we get stuck. We like, we like to be with people who believe the same way we do. And that's great. And that's where we're comfortable. But we're called to be with everyone. And that takes a different type of love. A different type of love. It takes a different type of understanding on everybody's parts. So I just want to name that for you because I don't want you to be surprised in June. But at the same time, I want you to think deeply about it. How do we love people that say things that we do not agree with? We love them, but it doesn't mean that we allow them to hurt others. This is tough stuff. This is the world that we're living in. May God guide us. May the Spirit open for us the way forward. Amen.